Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Arno. I'm from Revelator Studio, and we have uh, Dave Sharp of Office Sharp with us today. Um, we occasionally catch up uh, to talk about all things marketing and communications in the realm of architecture. And tonight, we're going to talk about websites. So, uh, Dave, is there anything you want to add to that? <laughs> No, that's a good intro. I know. Thank you. Yeah. So talking about websites, man, why did you pick websites as the topic for today? Like what, what was your thinking? Why websites for architects? Like it's something we talk about a lot, but like, why were you curious to discuss this one? Because it's been years that I've spent an unhealthy amount of time looking at architects' websites and obsessing still, over websites. <laughs> I still go crazy to see how bad some of them are. And I guess the way you could summarize it is that the ratio to of bad websites to good websites is grossly lopsided. There's way more bad ones than good ones. So when I see a good one, I usually use it as a case study of sorts to tell people what they should aspire to do. Not necessarily to copy, but just to kind of yeah. get the best uh, best practices from it. But yeah. so many websites are bad. Um, and I don't necessarily mean aesthetically, although that also happens. Sometimes they, you have very sleek websites, but then the copy and the messaging is just completely off. Yep. 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 Totally. Um, so the, the, w you and I had a, a, a list of subtopics we yep. wanted to cover. So yep. let's start basics. With let's start with some basics. Basics of yep. an architecture website. So what do Good you place to start. You, you were going to start. What so, do you think it should yeah. accomplish and how? Okay, so this one, I'm going to give a really annoying answer. I used to be so firm about what this should be, you know, the basics of what it should try and accomplish in terms of generating leads or inquiries or, or, or what have you, like what it would need to do that and what it wouldn't need. But I've, as I've like kind of grown over time as a marketing person, um, I think about, you know, website basics being kind of depends on your strategy because I meet def very different types of firms and some firms are really focused on, you know, activation and getting, getting inquiries and like trying to convert more of their visitors into leads and project opportunities, which is great. Like that's definitely an important job. Um, but then there's other firms that I meet and like speak to me and they say like, well, you know, we're kind of all good on that front. Like that's not really our issue. You know, we are just trying to really change the type of client that we have or the way that we're seen as a brand, as a practice. And for them, their website like has very, very different basics that it needs to achieve that job. So mm -hmm. I've kind of muddied the waters a little bit with that, <laughs> with that spiel, but, no, but, but that's I, kind I of think, it. Because I think, I that think that's the place to the start. Basics. I think that's the place to start because you shouldn't even begin to design or have a website designed for you before you know exactly what you wanted to accomplish. I think you're- Yeah, what your what your objective is. Um, yeah. It sounds very like marketing person to say that, but it, it's very true. Um, I think sometimes I see some pra some practices or firms kind of applying, the, the, they applying a strategy or some tactics for the wrong objective. Like they're not mm -hmm. kind of carefully thinking about what they're actually trying to achieve. And they- they see what another firm is doing and they'll do the same thing, but they don't realize that, that that other firm is trying to achieve something completely different. And it might not have anything to do with like getting new business, believe it or not, you know, or like whatever, it yeah, might be a yeah, totally yeah. different, coming well, it's from a like, totally different place. Um, it's like that conversation that our dear friend Nikita had started on LinkedIn a while back about the controversial um, uh, big website because they, they used to have a very cartoonish childish playful website and yeah. i always it, that website always annoyed me because you couldn't it was really a pain in the ass to navigate and find information about projects but they said oh that website was someone said that website was designed to attract um uh employees and, and interns. yeah 100 percent. and like so that, if you look so at true. it from that yep. perspective yeah it makes sense I still thought I still think it was a terrible website, but maybe I'm a little more nuanced. So I think your point on an uh, point spot on on that, but um, I think what there's something out of if we look at a website in terms of what is the kind of lowest 
yeah. or minim yeah. minimal yeah. viable products. So, uh, exactly. Kind of, yeah. kind of goal you should have. I think for architects, there are a few things that generally, yep. speaking, again, may not apply to 100% of people, but I think for most it would. Uh, you want it to be crystal clear, um, the mix, the website to make it crystal clear what you do and who you do it for. So mm -hmm. your messaging can be very simple and very brief, but it has to be crystal clear. Um, if you're going to show your work, it should be shown in a way that's elegant, easy to navigate and easy to comprehend. Yeah. And anything beyond that, I think is gravy. But if if at the very minimum you have a, a maybe even very simple looking but elegant and and well designed website, uh, which you can accomplish with services like Squarespace, by the way, yep. you don't have necessarily to have a custom website done for you. It's always yep. better, but it's also very expensive. Square yep. Squarespace is uh, thirty bucks a month or forty bucks a month. Yep. So. So I think that as far as the basics are concerned, that's it's kind of how I'd look at it is like, mm -hmm. if nothing else, make it a, a nice interactive business card or calling card that yep. people will at the very least not be re repulsed by. Yep. Yeah, and at best definitely. Too. You have an online presence at that point. Um, yeah. I definitely do get approached by small practices that have been operating for two or three years and they don't actually have a website yet. And that's not great, you know, um, at all because they're sort of, they're stuck trying to make decisions about what do I do with the brand name or the logo or like, should I, should I, or shouldn't I engage like a graphic designer to do this professionally? Should I do this myself? I think when like you, you don't have a website, you mean not at all? Not at all. Not even you know? a placeholder. Not even a placeholder. Like mm -hmm. no placeholder. Like they've bought a domain name, and that to me is like, that's doesn't matter what your objective is. That that's that's not like not going to work. So I think, you know, if we're talking about practices at a very very early stage, you know, you would you wouldn't think that we're speaking to that big of an audience saying get a simple kind of like Squarespace website, but there are actually a lot of them out there. Um, I get emails from them all the time. Um, so, so that's definitely the first stage. I think just more broadly, like a, a thing that's applicable to a bunch of different practices is that the basics, um, of, of a website can, can also mean not very many projects as well. And yeah. there are some, there are some really, really beautiful websites that are just one project or three projects or two projects. And that's fine. And that's, and it comes yeah. across really beautifully. I have like a one client, of, um, yeah, um, go for it who's who's a more established firm not huge but like they're up there and they do exquisite work and i know for a fact that they design dozens if not hundreds of projects but their website has i'm pretty sure it's less than a dozen maybe even less yeah. than 10 yeah but only the best and the, yeah. and the pictures for each one of them are top notch yeah that's the way to do it that is definitely um, the way to do it so i want to put it on my contrarian hat for a second Mm -hmm. Do you think it's still possible to be a successful architecture firm without any website at all? And I'm not talking about presence elsewhere online. I'm saying just no website. Mm. It might be possible, but I don't. The, th the funny thing is, like, I, there's not a whole bunch of examples I can even think of where there's a successful architecture firm that doesn't have a website. Just the other day, I was looking at a successful architecture, well, a successful ish architecture firm that put, popped up that didn't have an Instagram, and that caught me as weird because these days that's very rare that you'll find like a, a reasonably established architecture practice that doesn't have an Instagram. And mm -hmm. I remember thinking like, for how well known like this practice is, they're they're not that well known, which is a weird thing to say, but like for how established they are, maybe is a better way to put it. They they're surprisingly like under the radar and it's funny what an impact I feel like not having that presence is now I think not having a website is just gonna it's gonna be a hundred times worse like in terms of lack of visibility not turning up when people look for you just mm -hmm. can't be having that right like how how do you how do you like not turn up on Google when people put your name in you know by not having a website like it's just so bad for business I can't see anybody doing it hey what yeah. do you reckon um, 
I, I would tend to agree with you, I think. I think, yeah. like I mentioned before, at the very least, buy a domain name and, and have yeah, very a, least. a, a, a one-page website with your name and your contact info. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's actually a, it's not an architecture firm, but I think it's a graphic design and, and communications yeah. firm out of New Zealand called alt group. You might know them. No, I haven't. And it's altgroup.net. And okay. their, their homepage, they only have a one, one homepage and there's, it's all white and there's yeah. a short sentence in the middle of it that says this page left int intentionally left blank. Yeah, exactly. So that comes back to the initial thing of like brand um, and, and what you want to do as a brand. Like when you're at that stage of your kind of marketing journey where your priorities are more around kind of like quality of client, brand perception, employee quality, employee, potential employee interest in the practice, whatever trying to kind of brand equity you're trying to build, you could have a very dysfunctional website be part of that story. And like, Firms that aren't at that stage will look at you and think you're you've lost your mind, um, and that you like are you've you've kind of like lost it. But there's actually a lot of value in in kind of occasionally making moves like that if they're from a really good brand perspective. Um, so like a website that is like blank like that, and that might be unintentional. Sometimes sometimes brands do things that are like unintentionally important to their brand even though it's just like sloppiness um like no and this is intentional like Berkshire I've Hathaway. Heard, this I've is intentional from, right from other people who know them who say they're the busiest graphic design firm in the world like they don't need yeah. a website so that's kind yeah, of yeah exactly which is part of their brand image right mm. um it's maybe like you have to you have to it has to be done carefully and done by somebody who's like professional at executing that because if you try to implement that strategy yourself you definitely are on that fine line between pretentiousness and um and yeah. cool brandness yeah um there's a very very careful line to tread there and you don't want to necessarily like tip too far over the other side but um but yeah like that sort of move makes sense i mean i in the last year i i rebranded i changed my website and i'm i went much more towards um much more towards trying to define what the brand is about and and try and position myself kind of like higher in the industry to work with better known or, or more respected practices was kind mm -hmm. of my goal or direction I wanted to go bigger practices more kind yeah. of like architecturally practices mm -hmm. and um part of that was the trade-off that came with that was going you know we're not going to have as much information on the page we're not going to describe our services in as much detail we're not going to we're not going to do this whole variety of different things that are were really positive towards getting more business um and like I see people all the time, like criticizing websites for not having enough information or, or whatever. I used to do that myself, but I've realized that that definitely creates a shift in terms of how the brand's seen. So, um, so sometimes it can be for a good reason, even though as a pro byproduct, you might not get as many inquiries or you might not get as many people who understand your service as well as they did before. But those aren't those things aren't always universally positive. Like sometimes those can be bad things, <laughs> yeah, believe it or not. You can get a lot of tire kickers and then waste time uh, vetting them versus, like you said, if you move up market and you get fewer inquiries, but your average sale is like well, times what you used to it, do. Yeah. That makes it's sense. interesting. It is interesting. I mean, look, I honestly think I probably get more tire kickers because what I'm not putting out as much information about how my services are structured. I'm keeping it way more. Part of, part of the brand strategy is keeping it a lot more broad and ambiguous, which is really the opposite of what my approach used to be. It was like incredibly structured, productized, detailed, perfectly described. Like it was really, really broken down. So nobody that was coming to me was like, what do you do and how do you do it? Like they knew because it was written in complete detail on my website. So is a year but, enough time for you to gauge the effectiveness of your rebrand? The effectiveness happened straight away. Believe, Like really it, it, it did. Um, just straight away, different type of kind, kind of client was coming to me that wouldn't have come to me before. Mm -hmm. um, sort of, it sort of like put me in a little bit of a different league in terms of that perception. I also just feel like, um, you know, just this is this is a website thing, but you know, having the tools you need to like do business and having and making those yourself or having somebody prepare those for you, like things like fee proposal templates and presentation templates and all these capabilities statement templates, like getting those professionally done is like 
in terms of sales is 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 like a really game changing like upgrade in terms of having all of that stuff done at a really really high level. It just makes you look it pre- it presents so much better to a to a sophisticated client to like a high value client that uh-huh. anybody would want to work with them. Um, but yeah, so I think that's I think that's like what I think of when it comes to the website stuff in terms of like depending on what stage you're at and though how those priorities change, you you might be doing things. Um, not all marketing is just about trying to like get get somebody to contact you. So, um, so sometimes it's it's doing things. And like when we're talking about project selection, for example, that is also a bit of a mindset shift to mm-hmm. narrow down on your project selection because it does sometimes mean leaving out the possibility that that project number twenty five thirty, project number fifty five that there's something in that that is different or unique that would appeal to some sort of project type. That yeah. can be quite hard to kind of let that go. Um, There's a, a, a very simple tactic to overcome that fear, if that ever that's ever. Because um, I'm I my website is grossly out of date. It's so much out of date that I'm not gonna say how long it's been since I updated it. But um, I've been going through uh, my entire catalog of pictures and reorganizing everything, and I've, I'm posting not every project, but every project that I can, that I like or can stand behind from a, a professional perspective, I'm posting it on Behance. Yep. So that will be kind of a lower level, everything goes portfolio that's not necessarily geared towards clients, but if clients wants to see a specific project, I can yep. put them there. Okay. But when I do get around to revamping my website, then the website will only have the best of the best. And that might end up being a couple dozen projects out of 250 or something. Um, So I think, yeah, the curation is really uh, a big part of the process. So let's move to the do's and don'ts of websites and and Mm -hmm. what, what people should consider doing and absolutely avoid um, I think I, I only have really one piece of advice in that area is don't do something just because you see one of your competitors do it and you think it looks cool or you like it. Uh, anything that goes on one's website should really be a reflection of the overall brand strategy, as you mentioned before, and it should have a purpose. So if your competitor does something that makes sense to them and you find you look, it looks cool, but it does nothing for you. Then that's the 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 reason why you shouldn't do it. Basically, um, what's your take on do's and don'ts? What do you have for us? I think what you said earlier about sort of a simple message is a really good one to talk about um, in terms of a do, because mm-hmm. I think it's uh, sort of uh, it's an area that a lot of architects are really frustrated with. Is like. Like literally it's probably one of the most common briefs I get in terms of people contacting me. They go, I really need help like clarifying my message, simplifying my message. Like that's always there. Um, Just like really just picking like a few key things to narrow down on, like to not, you don't have to say 15 different reasons that you're a good architect or that your work's good or like the 12 ways that your spaces are nice, you know, just pick like two or three things, like keep it really simple, like in terms of your messaging and like, you just got to prioritize that. So I think prioritize a couple things, be afraid to like not say some stuff. Uh, Sorry. Don't be afraid to not say some stuff. Like you don't have to talk about every other way that your stuff's good. So I think it's just like a certain just confidence and just narrow down on a couple of things. And usually if you, you'll be able to decide what they are, if you just make a list and then start to, prioritize like what would the two or three most important things on this list be yeah. right so i think that's and, kind of a do yeah and and to add to that uh i find that a lot of architects are really have a hard time putting themselves in their clients shoes and thinking of their work in terms of what benefit does it bring to my client yep. what, yeah, what yeah, does yep, the totally. work i do uh do for my client because of architecture firms, even the best ones, talk about themselves. Like, we are X, we do this, we won those awards, we are awesome, blah, blah. No one gives a shit about that. What people want to know... I do. And that's that's (laughs) psychology. Like, it's not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you say. Yeah. 
is totally. what are you going to do for them? What Which yep. of their problems that keep them up at night are you going to help them solve? And once you hit that, many architects complain about not being able to charge enough. That's because they don't do what I just said. The ones who do, and I have I have several clients who actually have gone through that transformation and have started uh, talking to their clients in different ways. They charge whatever fee they want because they're positioned as the expert and people will pay for their expertise. The problem with most architects is they're seen as a commodity because they all sound the same. So the messaging should really be about and that's the hardest part, um, I'll be honest. That's really yeah. hard to do. And that's why it's good to hire uh, people who know how to write those things, like good copywriting. Definitely, such, definitely. To, to hammer it out for you. You may have a hunch as to what it is, but a good sales, even a sales copywriter, I know it's sacrilege for me to say that because people hate sales copy. But guess what? Sales copy works. It's unappealing in many ways, <laughs> but it yeah. works. That yeah. it, it, it uses psychology to get people to do what you would like them to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it, and again, it I'd say it depends on whether you're in that stage or not. Because like I wouldn't, you know, I th I think if like you're just if you're if you're going like I'm trying to get I'm trying to get more inquiries. Like I'm just trying to increase the volume, which is fine. By the way, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. That's like, that's where you're going to be at probably for the first, like probably for the first several years, or it's going to depend on what type of architect you are, what you would mm -hmm. aspire to be, you know, like all that sort of stuff. But yeah, like getting, getting more persuasive copy, more persuasive messaging, um, getting professionally professional help with that, I think is a really, really good idea. Yeah. Um, so like, when I say sales copy, yeah. uh, at a at a at a entry level, it can be like just basic sales copy, just yeah, to get people to take the action they want. But yeah. once you ele elevate your brand, you still want to think in those terms, um, and that's where um, I think some of the most persu persuasive people I've seen are very experienced uh, advertising sales right uh, copywriters. Yep. yep. So uh, you know you can do basic sales copy like. Uh, 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 white paper type of stuff that's very salesy, effective, but not very appealing. Or you can elevate your copy and work with someone who knows how to sell, but also knows how to make it sound. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I think so. Definitely. I mean, it's also, um, you know, you have to decide whether you want to talk about like the architecture service. Like, you know, you're talking about the client shoes and like relating to the client, what you're going to do for the client. Mm -hmm. it, you have to make a conscious choice about whether your kind of messaging strategy is going to revolve around like architect and client, like the service side of it, the business service side of the business, yeah. or your messaging should revolve more around the the space. What are you actually selling? Because like some some clients some clients come to certain architects because of the buildings, and others come because of the architecture firm. And that there, there's some firms that are both, but typically, like I find that practices will kind of fall into like one category or the other. Like there are really amazing architects that do incredible buildings that are like award-winning, that mm -hmm. are sick, that photograph well, that you see on the cover of, you know, Vogue magazine or Architectural Digest. They they can offer a very, very mediocre service. It doesn't matter because what they're delivering is pretty amazing and people are coming for that. So if their copy was like, we're going to work with you at every step of the journey and collaborate and listen, everyone would be like, well, I don't really give a shit about that. I just want the thing that's on Architectural Digest cover. Like there's a category of that customer and there's the category of that architect. But there's the other category, which is like the architect that doesn't do that kind of work. Like they just do much more normal work. That And the customer that's coming to them is not so much into that. Like, that's not what they're coming for. They're not coming for the thing on the front of the magazine. They're coming for like a nice house and a good service. Yeah. And that architect, that's like what their strength is. That's what they're really good at. They're just okay. Like, acknowledge, they have to acknowledge they're probably just okay at like the portfolio side, but they're really, really good at running a good business and being a good architect and a good person to work with. Mm -hmm. And then that's what their copy and stuff should accentuate. So yeah, I, think, you're I think there's a place something. for both. I think, you uh, know, I think you need both. But I think there's more of the latter than the former, like the, the star architect level people who can actually run a business based, purely based on aesthetics. There's, I yeah, think yeah. There's, there's a small percentage. Yeah. 
No, um, that's a great, and that's so true. And that's important. But I think like there's this kind of, there's two sides I've noticed and they tend to just like throw, sh- they just like take massive shits on each other. <laughs> they hate each other. They do. And, um, you know, I think it's cool to just kind of go like, there is two sides and not every architect is like a magazine cover architect, but that's okay. But like, thank God we have magazine cover architects. We love that. That's okay. Like they, they can do their thing. And like magazine cover architects, also shouldn't like look down their nose at architects that have more sales or persuasion driven copy or are just trying to talk about like how they're going to make it a smooth journey to work with a client on their first house and like it's accessible like that's great and i think like you need you need both but i think it's important for architects to sort of think about which category they should probably like position and this is positioning right like marketing we talk about positioning mm-hmm. looking at the whole landscape of the market and deciding like where should we like plonk our business to be in the sweet spot we're putting it in the right place and so i think it's just like positioning your practice realistically based on where you sit in terms of project versus service um so so look that does that sort of does that sort of make sense yeah it does um i i personally have a bit of an issue with the whole cover mag- magazine cover architect thing because that's what you and I both went to architecture school and that's what we're fed in school. They, we all think we can become that. And the reality is most people won't. Well, it's and, something to think about. Yeah, no, sorry, Playmat. Go, go for but it. I also think that uh, the sexy architecture takes way too much precedence over competent architecture that does what it's supposed to without yep. necessarily going overboard and uh, on yep. the, the aesthetic or, or, image front which i think as i get older i find that way more important because i'd rather see an average decent but average looking school that does what it's supposed to do really well like it functions really well it helps students perform better it helps the community life whatever the case may be than a very sexy school designed by say Zaha Hadid or or her office since she's no longer around but yeah but that looks super sexy and he's on all magazine covers but starts falling yep. apart five years in you know yeah maybe and maybe so there's also yeah. that to consider like if you can do both if you were like a Louis Kahn or a Mies van der Rohe and you have the ability to do both more power to you because those guys were really exceptional architects on pretty much any level but most architects aren't so let's i think there's realistic conversation to be had about one's aspirations versus the reality and be okay to because you can be a very competent and highly successful architect and never get published or or get published once totally totally and there's nothing wrong with that um and i think i mean most architecture is that way to be honest Yep. Uh, but we just think more about the sexy architecture because it's more in the in the in yep. the culture in the psyche. Definitely, definitely. Um, but that's a, yep. almost a conversation for another time, man. Right? But that honestly, I think that's like the most important conversation. I think that's the question. I think that's the conversation the industry needs to have when they talk about marketing. Because I I speak at these events or sit on these panels, and I just see the two sides kind of talking at each other. They don't, yeah. and I don't think they realize they're talking about two industries within an industry. The, the publications yeah. the architect architect is in a completely different category to the other architect that is providing the architecture service, but is not producing that kind of like cultural work, I guess is, I, I think there's like a hard way to put it. Like in, I remember when I was like working at a practice in Japan um, during uni, um, during my like year between, before my master's. And they were telling me that in Japan, I might've got this wrong, but they were telling me that there's kind of in their industry, there's kind of two categories of architect. There's like, a, a building architect and then a, like an art architect and there's kind of two and they're kind of clearly defined like a practice will know whether it's in the art cult art category or the building category yeah and or construction category or whatever you want to call it mm-hmm. and i think you know we have something like this in australia we have like architects and building designers but like there was this idea that within architecture there's these kind of camps that are clearly defined but i think you know, we we kind of like get our get our kind of wires crossed about different strategic things and tactics and what should we do and what shouldn't we do and what's the problem with architects versus you know all these things. But but I think like there's room for both of these groups. But I think you're right, man. Like it is realistic that 
it's it's unrealistic to think that every practice will become or will want to become that other that that practice that's on the magazine cover. I think like the problem that you pointed out is really true though, which is that there are definitely some trade off. There's some challenges if you're not that um, you're not that magazine cover architect because the industry, the media, um, the way that the public consumes architecture, which is primarily through images, that's all very driven towards and benefits that very portfolio oriented yeah. architect. And frankly, that's why there's so many of them. And they're so successful, mm -hmm. you know, like the practices that I tend to interview on, on my podcast, I'm very biased towards those practices that are winning awards and in magazines. Um, that just tends to be who I gravitate to. And part of the reason for that is that those are the people that the rest of the industry will want to listen to. They're kind of influential and, and, and that's, and that's the case. I mean, there are good local architecture practices that are doing good work, but they don't have very much profile. Um, mm -hmm. Their work's not published all over the place. They, you know, nobody well, in the industry the, has heard of them. But that's not a problem. They're running a good business. They're running the a same, thriving little business. The same way uh, a, a regular person wants to know everything about the superstar model, and yep. plain-looking people are not that interesting. I mean, it's a bit crude to yeah. say it that way, but yeah. that's it's, the reality of is life. it any different in fashion, music, yeah. art? You know, any 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 creative industry is going to have people that are kind of like celebrities within that industry. And some clients are going to show a certain amount of like, I don't know what the word for this is, but like connoisseurship maybe. <laughs> I think it's like the technical term. Yeah. And they are going to be like the art collector or the watch collector or the music listener yeah. who as a consumer knows all the people and they know who the cool people are and they know who the people are doing the most cutting edge shit. And that's that's a category of customer that like that part of the industry thrives on and speaks to. And when they have their marketing brief, it's like, I want the kind of client who is design savvy, who knows about architecture, who comes to us because of the quality of the work that we do. They've chosen us out specifically. If you're saying any of those things in your marketing brief, it's because you're trying to attract that architecture connoisseur client. But the thing is you have to be on the magazines to attract that kind of client because that's yeah. where they're, that's how they're influenced so if those yeah. are your goals, if like that's who you want, you're going to have to like step it up in that kind of direction. Mm. Um, but then again, like just, just just the other day, I was giving a talk at this event thing in South Australia and somebody was going, our clients don't read magazines. They don't care about what other architects are doing. They don't, they don't give a shit about architecture awards. And they were, and that was kind of like a bit of a rebuttal to what I had spoken about because I spoke about magazines and awards mm. and all that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And you know what? Like, fair enough. Their clients don't care about that, right? That's like not a big deal. That's so, fine. So but, this is my but, perfect cue to throw in an automotive analogy because I love those. Yeah, please. Um, Should be a motorbike analogy for you, right, man? Well, I like both. Um, yeah. I, I, I like both. But the point is you can either uh, buy a Toyota or Ferrari. The Toyota, you nobody will notice you, but it will do what it's supposed to do. It will work yes. ever. And if you yep. take good care of it, it'll take good care of you. The Ferrari, everybody will stop you at the gas station. They'll come take selfies with you, but you'll have to pay yep. fifteen thousand dollars every time you get you want to do an oil change and every yep. time you want to totally change your brakes, it's gonna be a fifty thousand dollar job. So, yep. but you'll get the attention you're looking for. So I think that's the perfect analogy because that's really what, let's call it plain architecture versus magazine architecture, the, the dichotomy is. It's like you whether you have to, this as a client and as a, as a practice as well, you have to decide whether you want to be Toyota or Ferrari. Mm -hmm. and, and once you're clear on which you are, then you can focus on those clients. A hundred percent. You got to be clear on it, man. It got to be realistic. And you've got to um, like, yeah, even and decide like, oh, maybe I want to be Ferrari. Like who says they want to be Toyota? You know, like not many people have the kind of the straight, like that's always used as the analogy to like the marketing people to sort of get people thinking about making their brand better seen, right? It's like, do you want to be like the Toyota or do you want to be the Mercedes or whatever? Like, you know, like and everyone's meant to go, oh, I want to be the Mercedes, but it's a problem if like you can't build the Ferrari car. Like if all you can build is the Toyota, if that's like what your business does and produces, like you're you're not going to get very far like trying to 
have a Ferrari mindset on it when you when you've got a Toyota chassis. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I think like you have to, you have to actually like you have to have a realistic view and get some. I think that's where some outside feedback is valuable. You know, like that's kind of what I'm. As a marketing consultant, I think also we have to put ourselves into kind of categories. When I talked about my kind of rebrand and business shift, it was about me deciding which category I kind of wanted to move into and be in and be comfortable in. And mm-hmm. I wanted to go into more of that. I don't want to say like the Ferrari category, but, you know, screw it. The Ferrari category is where I kind of wanted to be because I saw that's where I wanted to like work in that area of the world. Because yeah. at heart, I'm an architecture guy. I went to architecture school. I love fucking great architecture. And like, that's what I kind of wanted to, I want to gravitate in that world. Like that's where I want my career to go. Um, but I still love the kind of the marketing world for the, for the, for the Toyota, like for the 90% of practices that are just doing good work, are working in their area, in their city, word of mouth. Um, they're getting their name out there. They're doing business and they're doing great. But I think like there's a lot of marketing that works for them that you maybe don't even necessarily need a big time architecture marketing um, specialist to help you with because really you're just trying to get inquiries. You're trying to like keep your digital presence up. I think it's, I think in a, in some ways it's a little bit more straightforward, um, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Yeah. There's straightforward things to either side. Also just putting your stuff, to, sending your stuff out to magazines is pretty straightforward in its own way. So look, there's, there's kind of like, yeah, there's elements to both of it, but Man, I think that's. Uh, I think that was a great place to go with this conversation because I think it's like at the core of the the the, the yeah. problem that and, and practices think, need to think about. You like know? you said before, that's the conversation the architecture industry needs to have. Uh, not, yeah. not base their perception of themselves and others uh, based on on false kind of premises, but really look at. Yeah, what the What's reality of their on? practice is and, and, and have those hard conversations with the people who help them market themselves. Cause that's yep, really- definitely, definitely. Um, and, and also like, you know, just also just stop criticizing each other. <laughs> like the two, the two different sides, I feel like um, there's like, you know, that, that Ferrari architect um, there's a lot of people that, you know, on LinkedIn and stuff, whenever I post about this stuff or have a podcast about it, that are like, well, like, isn't it, isn't it something wrong with our society that, or something wrong with architecture that there is this kind of architecture. And like, that is probably a conversation for like another day, but also, you know, if it's just self-evident that there is that, there is a lot of demand for that category of work. We see that in the prominence of like so many great architecture firms, right? So it exists, it's a real thing. Um, And I think, you know, it's just kind of, yeah, like deciding where you kind of sit with it, I think it, I think is important. Um, but, but yeah, I man, think it's... the nature of the business is such that architectural services are expensive, and so that tends to make them only accessible to people with deep pockets or institutions with deep pockets. Um, because and and there's kind of that tension between the idealism of architecture when you're in school and you think. Mm, you mm, do- mm. You can design buildings for everyone, but the reality is like most people can't afford an architect. And uh, that's why we have large scale developers who build tracked housing and replicate the same house a thousand times to to keep their costs down and be able to to pass it on. And yeah, those are not architects houses. Are they bad? I don't know. I've never lived in one. Maybe not that great, but maybe not that horrible either. Um, But the... I, I think the, the problem is I don't know if there's a way to, to square the circle, if that's even a thing you can say that might be a fascism. <laughs> um uh between the desire of architects to do all kinds of work, including for people that may not have the means for it, and the reality of the business is that you're gonna have to work for people with deep pockets one way or another whether it's yep. large projects for big companies or institutions or wealthy clients who can afford the, their dream home. Yep. That's, I don't know if that's a problem you can ever solve, but it's an interesting debate to be sure. Man, I I have seen... Okay, so like on the one hand, I totally agree. Like I, I think that the there's a lot of architects, man. We're a very granular industry. Like Australia, I don't know. I think there's like 12,000 architecture firms or something along that line. It's, it's crazy. We're a small country. We have a lot of architecture firms. Yeah. There should be enough 
architects at both the high end, the middle end, the affordable end at any given time to yeah. be able to cater to anybody who wants an architect. There is not there is not an architect shortage. Like there's a shortage of everything else. There is not an architect shortage. Um, so anybody that wants to should be able to work with one. There is obviously like a economy of scale thing with certain budgets and so forth, but there is lots of good studios that are trying to come up with ways to do just like things with hourly rates or fixed fees. Like there's structure, there are studios that are structuring ways to make it possible that people with very like budgets that would have previously been impossible to work with an architect, mm -hmm. they are finding ways to do it. So that that's a really, really good thing to, to see. But I think like when I say there's no shortage, I also, on the same, by the same time, I see a lot of architects and ones that I work with that are trying to launch new ways to like make architecture more accessible into the public. And those yeah. projects are, are failing and some, some succeed, but a lot of them fail because unfortunately the demand is not there, not for them in particular, but it just seems like actually there isn't as much demand for architecture as architects think there is. Mm -hmm. And we just take it for granted that there's all these people that want to work with architects, but you know, they just, ah, oh, there's just too many barriers to entry, but I actually think it's the opposite problem. There's a lot of actually great architects that would love to offer their services more broadly to the public and the public don't want it. So I'm kind of like, how do we actually solve that problem or, or, or kind of work on that? And I think that is a marketing challenge, but something that's come up over time is this idea of like, how does architecture, the category market as an industry, you know, we're not like dog food. We don't have two big companies or, you know, we don't have a, we, we do get together as an industry, but we don't like market as an industry or advertise as an industry. We don't do any market research or any really great market research as an industry, at least in yeah. Australia. It's been a long time since uh, any of our like peak bodies have commissioned any like half decent market research um, or run any good ad campaigns in my, like in my opinion. So you know, like, I think that there's a lot of room for improvement there. I sort of feel like maybe that's the way to get more design out there is to actually try and like get the public kind of more into it. And I think anybody that's doing anything that's about trying to get the public like educated or excited or involved in architecture is a really good thing. So I, I kind of think more of that is kind of yeah, part of the... And I think the part of the problem is, is in my opinion, twofold is one, there's been a lack of innovation in architecture because we've been building the same way for let's say That's century. Yep. Um, and I think that lack of innovation is not for a uh, lack of architects trying, but I think is predominantly regulatory in nature. Um, yep. Regulations make it nearly impossible to innovate for yep. a myriad of re reasons. And uh, and I think that's one of the big problems of architecture. And that's, you know, it le also leads to the housing crisis that we're all experiencing. Yeah. I don't know in totally. Australia, but in Canada, it's ninety percent of it is regulatory. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If, I mean, if the government loosened the rules just a bit. Uh, we would be able to build a lot more and a lot faster. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, uh, there's that there's that side to it for sure. Point. I mean, look, but you could also say like you know maybe um I, it's good to see some architects are getting out there really in terms of like policy and advocacy and yeah. dealing with government. I have no idea how you deal with government and get regulation changed and stuff like that. But there's some really smart architects that know how all of that stuff works and they're out there having meetings with politicians and doing all this important stuff. And I think that that's like incredibly impressive. Um, also just in terms of innovation, I mean, there is some, um, I, I open up Twitter or Instagram every day. I see, you know, a photo that's absolutely viral of an architectural space generated by AI or something like that. All these people that are building these like AI, you know, architecture and interior services, just gaining, you know, 10,000 followers a day because it's becoming absolutely like this phenomenon and not a single one of them are architects, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's kind of like this also interesting sort of thing of like, there are these, um, where is the public interested in design? Like where is their attention going? And it's like, are architects kind of, are they getting involved in that? I don't always feel like you just need to jump on whatever the latest trend is at all, but it's it's interesting because whenever there's a sign that, hey, people are really interested in architecture, that always catches my attention because I never expected it. I'm used to people not being interested in architecture. Yeah. Yeah. So whenever it's like going viral on Twitter, I'm like, oh shit, people are, there's like lots of people and young people and this is amazing or like, you know, like a rapper will start tweeting about how much they want to like learn about Frank Lloyd Wright or something. And I'm like, oh my God, like actually architecture in culture. I love to see it. Um, but, you know, so like whenever we see signs of that, it's really positive, but I feel like that's also important sort of piece of the puzzle. But I also, you know, maybe, 
talking earlier about people being really like divided on things or like these two sides in the industry. I think these are areas where um, both sides can see the benefit of there being improvement, whether it's like regulation, whether it's technology, whether it's like culture, promoting the industry. I think that's something that everyone can kind of get around. So I'm also happy that we talked about that because I think those are also kind of those conversations that architects need to keep having because it's not just them taking shots at each other about whether or not people should have $5 million houses or not and whether architects should be involved in that. So I really like to see it. <laughs> it's really yeah, good. Yeah, I think it comes down to what can you learn from the other side because there's something yeah. to learn. Um, but I think that this kind of architects shitting on each other is also a reflection of the scarcity mindset that you see a lot in the industry as opposed to yeah. a growth mindset where you you can easily picture that there's room for everyone or for most people. Uh, definitely and i mean uh, we're getting a bit sidetracked into a whole different debate here but i think those are all fascinating yeah. things to 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 talk yeah. about yeah we we only touched about half of the points we wanted to make about website uh, it doesn't matter we'll do it another time yeah so i'm i'm thinking we should wrap up because i believe you have to go and it's almost <laughs> yeah for me and yep. um do the other half uh next yep. conversation just post it post this on youtube in the meantime Yep. Always a pleasure. Arno. Thank you so much, mate. We started talking about websites. We got derailed about two minutes in and started talking about the industry. Perfect. We should just like chop out the bit about websites at the beginning um, and we'll be good to go. I think <laughs> Thanks, those Arno. are the best conversations. You start somewhere and you end up somewhere unexpected. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Thanks for mate. your time, brother. I'll talk to you Thank soon. You. you too. Bye-bye.